Yeah, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is History is Here to Help. And uh, we are joined today by an old friend. We know him through Project Expedite Justice, uh, Nicholas uh, Sussman Heron. Um, and he's from Colombia. And we're going to talk to him about uh, the troubles in Latin America. When I say Latin America, I mean everything south of the American border. That's all Latin America. <clears throat> Welcome to the show, Nicholas. It's just nice to see you. Thank you, Jay, and thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. So, yeah, you know, I mean, this this question is raised by what's happening at the border, and the uh, the slings and arrows that Joe Biden is 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 uh, incurring on what's happening at the border. We need to look at the border. We need to look south of the border. We need to figure out why all these people want to come across the border, and what makes them want to do that how we can fashion, how can we fashion a, a better relationship diplomatically, uh, economically, and of course, in terms of immigration. Because it seems like, you know, as with the infrastructure, these issues have not been top of mind uh, over the past mm, generation. And we're paying a price for that. So uh, you, you essentially live in Colombia. Um, and I, I just like to know your thoughts about what has been happening in terms of the evolution of the American um, relationship uh, with Latin America? Right. Uh, so I think the relationship between the U.S. and Latin America has been a longstanding one and has been an important one. I would say that for almost every country in Latin America, its relationship to the U.S. is one of the main concerns every government has either because they are close partners and they need to keep that relationship that way. That would be the case of Colombia, for example, that has been a longstanding partner since time immemorial, I would say, even since, since our independence, we've been close partners to the US. Uh, or even with the rise of new governments, left state governments that establish their, their relationship in opposition and many of their policies in opposition to the US. So I wouldn't say it's minor, right? Uh, and therefore, anything that happens in Washington um, is going to have an impact on Latin America. Uh, because we're close partners, we cooperate economically, and we depend highly on what's going on in the US. And, I, and there I'm speaking mostly about Colombia, for example, that relies a lot on the US for a lot of aspects. So of course, anything that happens there uh, is important. And then coming a bit down to the day-to-day -day citizen, the U.S. has always been uh, a place of opportunity, right? A place to go to when things are not going good in your country, either because the political situation is bad or because just the economical and the opportunities you have are not good. And the U.S. is the place to go to because uh, there's this story, true to some extent, that it's a land of opportunity, that there are things to do, and there's an undeniable factor that I would say and it's the exchange rate between currencies that allow people to earn higher wages in the US, even if it's what you would call low paying wages and send money back home. So your work is worth more and it's going to help your family. And that happens in many, many countries. Yeah, I, I don't understand exactly what's happening in terms of um, you know, the continued efforts to migrate across the border um, documents or no documents, uh, resistance by Homeland Security or not. Uh, you know, it's the, you know, the, the well-informed Latin American will know that, um, say, in the Trump administration and to a, a certain extent in the Biden administration, uh, he or she not welcome here. Um, we were going isolationist. Uh, a lot of people in this country are racist. Uh, they don't want them here. Um, the, and the border is dangerous. The border is difficult. Uh, the immigration service is not friendly. Uh, there's no Statue of Liberty being held out right now for anybody from south of the border. Um, and, but they keep coming. And, and conditions, um, you know, I guess conditions south of the border in a number of those countries are not, not swell. And they're dangerous. And the economies are failing. And you know, governments are becoming uh, authoritarian, and um, gee, it, you know, they, they, but they keep coming, and I, I don't understand why they keep coming with all the troubles. It, to me, it's just, it's just logic, I guess, that leads me to believe 
that things are getting worse down there and they're still willing to take these greater risks and um you know uh, the the u.s may not look as sweet as it did a few years ago and they still come what what's the process um you know i, I know it's country by country of course and you can speak of one country at a time but what is driving people to make these risky crossings now yeah i think you hit the point uh very accurately there jay because it's precisely that this is not like a collective decision every person going and traveling makes an individual decision to go to the u.s looking for opportunity and the explanation is as simple as you say things at home are worse individually speaking there are no jobs the security is not promising uh, you're facing difficulties and you think that it's worth taking the risk of going to the u.s in these conditions right because we're speaking of people who are trying to get into the u.s in very difficult conditions and facing a lot of dangers right because they think that even taking the risk is better than what they could be facing at home in terms of jobs in terms of security in terms of jobs and security it does not matter and there's uh, a lot of stories of success if you ask any family in Latin America, I would say, of course, with the, with the differentiation from country to country, everyone has a cousin, a friend, a neighbor who was facing difficulties, went to the US undocumented and at the end succeeded in some way, right? And, and that goes around and the immigration difficulties are not recent. You know, I've been listening to this since forever, right? Since I was very small. And of course, situations vary a bit and maybe who holds the office in the White House change. But overall, the U.S. is pretty stable in its approach to migration, I would say, in these cases, and people are willing to take the risk and know there's ways to do it. Uh, and the, the cost of opportunity is what they consider, and they, they just travel. And that just lets you imagine how bad things are going home uh, and how desperate are these people. And that I think that's something that that you should consider like like someone some secretary or homeland security or whatever agency telling them like migration policies have not changed don't come here is not going to do any uh, in any solution because people know that this is going to be difficult and they are willing to take the risk and the situation at home is as bad that they are willing to take the risk regardless right mm -hmm. so um what what is happening at home that it makes these make these people people so desperate to seek sanctuary to make them so worried that they they see it as a life-threatening risk to stay there um what is the process i know again all the countries are not the same you have to look at them one by one but in general um there seems to be a decline am i right and and what what are the factors in play Right, so I would say the main factor in most countries is the economical factor. As I tell you, uh, it's usually it's an individual decision, right? It's someone who says things are going bad. I'm in a crisis. I don't have a job. Uh, I'm short on, uh, on money. I'm going to go to the U.S. The thing is that this is not one person thinking this. You have inequality. You have poverty. You have structural problems that most of the countries face. Uh, so the people decide to go there. Uh, I would say that's the main factor, economic instability and the promise of better opportunities just because of the fact of earning money in dollars. I would say that's the first thing. But you uh, know, it's, 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 maybe, maybe it's, um, you have to look, you know, under the economics for a moment um, and say, what well, you know, why is that? Uh, the, these countries have resources, they have people, um, they, um, they, they could be doing better, um, can, are the governments not aware, not caring uh, of these countries uh, to develop um, industries and an economy? Well, why don't they have decent economies? Uh, why, why doesn't the government take care of them in some way and to provide some kind of economic activity or um, entitlement, you know, some kind of uh, so, social safety net that will help them? Uh, why is there such a disconnect? Right. Uh, so the thing is complicated and it goes to history. Uh, the thing is that Latin America since forever has been seen as a prime material producer and the way of development usually has been through the intervention of foreign companies, right? 
So as the as the countries to some extent lack the knowledge, lack the infrastructure, lack the capacity to set up industries and a lot of things, the way to do it is uh, providing conditions to bring foreign investment that is going to bring money and to some extent bring development, but development is tricky because it could be development for the country to some extent, but it's development that is not uh, reflected in an improvement of conditions for the people. So, so that's a problem. That's the first problem. So basically, uh, foreign companies come, extract resources, or uh, set up, uh, I don't know, factories or services, companies, on, on, because it's cheap to do it. But then the, the earnings and the income and the it are not staying in the country. They're staying out. And as the governments need uh, those companies to come and invest, the conditions in which they do it are not the best for the country, but are the ones that they can offer to be attractive to them, right? Because it's a competition for, for cheap labor and for cheap uh, raw material, right? So uh, if, I don't know, one country does not does it, then the next one will do it. And if it's not in Latin America, they would look at an other impoverished region in the world that is willing to do it. So, so that's a problem with the economic model. That's, that's one thing. And the other thing uh, is that it depends highly on the elites that control the country, right? And usually these are elites coming from wealthy sectors of society who share this model of, of development and think that country development is going to uh, reflect on the, on the improvement of, of, of conditions of the population. And that correlation is not uh, a reality, it's not a necessary correlation unless you set in place uh, public policy, social welfare, uh, and, and, the, and there's not enough money to do it. And if you do it, that will make uh, setting up corporations, factories, and so on uh, more expensive, right? So it's a, a sort of vicious cycle where you have to keep your conditions cheap in order to bring uh, foreign investment, but then foreign investment is not going to help you um develop your your country or at least develop your people because th those are two different things that have to be separated uh because one is not the result of the other yes i think you know uh, foreign investment is an important thing to look at um you know the way to bootstrap a company a country uh into um you know a better economy is to have foreign investment especially if it has no um, capital you know, at the, at the current time. And I'm reminded of a deal reported a few years ago where uh, China wanted to um, get some resources out of Brazil, namely iron ore. Um, so they came in there, invested a lot of money into a steel factory, um, and that was very successful. But they had their way. They had their way. They cut the deal on their own, on their own terms. And all, at the end of the day, what they were doing is just taking all the iron ore, cheap, and, and creating steel or moving the ore offshore. And um, bottom line is they were better negotiators. And, um, you know, the government of Brazil could be had. Uh, and so you need some, you need some uh, strong negotiators if you're going to negotiate with other countries or companies outside who might, might be interested in investing in you. Um, and that's that's a that, that really hamstrings a lot of the possible developments I think in in Latin America, um, I, and I don't know what could be done um, to fix that. It seems to me that's a key thing. You have the people, you have the resources, and all you have to do is put the investment into it, and bingo, you know you you change the direction of the country. Instead of moving down, it moves up. Um, What's missing? Yeah, I, I think there it's it's part of the I would say the production model that the and, and not only locally but globally, right? So again, you need foreign investment and, and which would be the correct way to do it. You do this, but you're not as radical and you're not trying uh, to cut costs at expense of the people or of the country, right? I understand that you have to make a business and you have to make earnings but you have to have in mind that there are some conditions that should be respected, right? Uh, so if that is not respected uh, to, to some extent, 
by, by the companies and even the governments that that um, house these companies uh, in their terms of business responsibility, business regulation, human rights standards. I don't know. Uh, there are many ways to, to get hold of companies and ask them to be ethical because many of the things they do in our countries would not be accepted at their own countries, right? That is why they do it outside. Um, so th that is one way to handle it. The other way to handle it is that the uh, Latin American go uh, governments to, to, because it's, it's the region we're speaking about, uh, start regulating that and controlling that. But again, that is going to bring the result of less investment, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you need that money uh, to do the thing. So the negotiations at the end are very unfair, right? Because it's uh, choosing between an unfair deal or no deal at all. Uh, th that's the decision they, they face many times. And it could be Russia, but it can be the US, right? Uh, they decide who are they selling their, their labor to. If they're not more close to the US or Russia, to, to, the, um, to China or Russia, they're going to do it. And that happens with Brazil, that happened uh, with Venezuela, for example. But in the case of Colombia, it happens with the US, right? Uh, and, and when it comes to doing money, this ideological preferences being right side or left side do not matter. When you're talking money, you're trying to make a profit. <laughs> Touche. So uh, let's let's talk history for a minute. After all, we're we're here to look at history and see what we can learn and and how it could be helpful. And I always go back to the Monroe Doctrine, eighteen twenty, I think it was, uh, where the President Monroe said uh, to everyone outside of this continent, he said, "You leave South America, Latin America alone. It's ours." And, and, and you know, to me, inherent in that is. Uh, uh, that's a statement of power. He was, uh, you know, uh, reflecting power, expressing power to the world, um, you know, and making and making Latin America belong to the United States in some sort of territorial way. But inherent in that, Nicholas, don't you think there was a, a kind of promise of noblesse oblige? Yes, we, you know, we're running the continent here, but we'll also help you. Yeah. And we want to have good relations. And and I and I my own view of it is that we have failed in the, the inherent promise of noblesse oblige. So we, you know, we 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 stated our claim, but we haven't uh, performed our obligations. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, yeah, that was the situation actually. So let's let's go let's go history again. So the U.S. got its independence in 1776, right? So a bit ahead of, of, of the rest of, of, of the continent, right? Uh, the, the independence process, and I can be mistaken here, and uh, begin around the 1800s, right? Mostly around uh, 1810 to 1820, more or less, right? Mostly from Spain, some from France, but mostly from Spain, right? And uh, Portugal. And Portugal, absolutely, exactly. Uh, so yeah, what was the thing? What happened with a, with a lot of these independences is that these independences were not truly about being independent, right? They were triggered because the local elites in, in, in Latin America were not allowed to participate in the, in the issues that were going on in Spain, in Portugal, or in France, right? Usually these were people who were born in Latin America from parents from Spain and so on. And, and, and the, at least Spain and Portugal, I am not that familiar with the French, had a very clear differentiation of who got to participate and who uh, got to decide on some things and who didn't based on who you were and who you were born from, right? Um, so basically the independence was not driven because of a need of everyone being free. It was basically driven by the need of these local elites who have control and power, right? And, and that is a problem. And these were elites educated in Europe under European model who knew the process of the US and so on. Uh, and they wanted to do a lot of things, but they needed allies, right? Because they had uh, vast, huge territories, hard to govern with diverse populations and they didn't want uh, to have anything to do with their former colonial power, right? So they tried to look for allies uh, there and in, in every aspect, right? In every aspect. And, and what many of these countries thought was, okay, a good way to go there if we don't want to depend from, from other European powers is look up, let's go to the US, they have like 30 or so years of experience and they're doing more or less fine. And that is why uh, also Monroe saw like, this is a, a, like fertile territory for us to expand our influence, right? 
because we are also a young nation, but we are ahead of them and we need to get power. And, and of course, they offered development, and, but that has been the model of, of, of the US, to be very honest about it, is that we help you, we offer development, but at the expense that you do and develop in the way we tell you to do it. And this way, not usual, it's not that selfish, you know? And uh, it's usually a way in which the US is benefited. And sometimes it's a way that departs from the US knowledge of the context that is not the same knowledge of the context that countries have of their own reality, right? And that is a problem because then they are asked to do a lot of things that the US thinks could be better and what could work for their development, not, not only the US, but for those countries, but the reality is that it's not true because the conditions are not given for that, for that to work. So I think there's this where it is failing, right? It's, it's imbalanced and sometimes it's decontextualized. Well, you know, it sounds like, um, you know, some of the commentary about Afghanistan, you can't, you can't build a nation state, uh, on, you know, with your culture on top of somebody else, somebody else's culture. And I think we were trying to do that uh, more, more recently, more, more and more recently. Um, so, uh, you know, why these, these countries have come up to be unstable. Many of them are still completely unstable. The government turns around, the junta comes in, there's a coup. Uh, there's an assassination, there's a jailing, um, there's an authoritarian leader emerges and, and squashes the rule of law. Um, it seems to keep happening. And of course, there are countries that are better than other countries at this. There are countries where you can actually find a middle, middle class life in, in South America, but um, mostly not, I think. And maybe it's because of the economy. Uh, but I think part of it is that there's a lack of stability. Uh, and there's a lack of security. Just one little note, I, a friend of mine wanted to go, was it, it was not Colombia, it was uh, nearby Colombia, it was in Central America. He wanted to go mine some kind of uh, mineral. And he bought a bunch of D8 tractors, caterpillars, uh, took them down there. And he went into the woods to mine the mineral. And he ran into um, demands, extortion demands, he ran into violence, he ran into drugs um, and theft. He couldn't do it. And the government was not able to protect him. Um, and he, he had to give it up. And that might have been a valuable you know, experience with a fair number of jobs and all, but the, the environment of the country wouldn't allow it because the government was not responsible, um, because there was a, no security and no stability. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have a feeling there's other places in Latin America where the same thing would happen. Uh, and as a result, foreign investment is limited and it perpetuates itself. But, you know, what are the reasons why so many of these countries are unstable? What are the reasons why so many of them are um, um, insecure in terms of personal security? Right. So... There, I would say it comes, again, you could trace our problems back to, to colonial times even, right? Uh, so most Latin Americans and agricultural economies uh, that have relied uh, even in some sort of feudal mod model, right, of development. So you have families that since forever have owned the land, have owned the means of production, right? So they are the wealthy families and now they not only own the land, but they own companies, or banks, or 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 the uh, so all the all the wealth is concentrated in the same families. Who are the families that at the same time either exercise government or are close to other families that exercise government? Right. So all political power, all economical power is concentrated in few families and few groups. That since colony, and, and I go back to my my previous comment. They didn't care about a, of, of, a, of a country as a project of development for the people, but saw the government and the country as a way to guarantee power and wealth. That's, that's one of the problems, right? Uh, and as they have the, the, uh, um, all, the, all, all sorts of power, they're able to keep themselves in power by legal and illegal means, because that's something that, that should also 
uh, be, be clarified. And it's that usually many of these elites have close ties uh, to illegal businesses, right? So sometimes it's not only that the government is not capable to address the situations because it just cannot, because there's not strong institutions, because the country is hard to govern, because uh, illegal groups um, are very strong, is because sometimes they're interested in that, right? And they also profit from that other that other aspect. So that that is one of the things, right? Uh, and there's lots of inequality, right? So that makes things very hard to to run because inequality on what basis is it economic racial what is it uh, all all of it all of it but, but 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 mostly economical the thing is that it it's intersectional right so the people who are uh, racial minorities are also are also economically impoverished and don't have access to political power so it's very complicated they, they're excluded in many ways uh, and so and many of the conflicts can be explained because of that. It's because the, the spaces to participate in government, to participate uh, in politics are so closed that people say, you know, I have no other option than take arms, right? So many of the insurgency you've seen in Latin America since forever comes from uh, impoverished communities that see no access to other ways of doing government and, 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 and caring for their interests. I'm not saying that that it is okay, but I, I'm saying that they don't have option. And it didn't have anything to do with being left or right. These were uh, laborers, farmers, who had absolutely no possibility of caring for themselves, right? So it, it, it was not about politics. It was about having access. And then it was capitalized by other groups with political interests. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it becomes an intersection with illegal uh, businesses and so on because they need funding or they start participating of the political game, of course, because when you have guns, you have power. And when you have power, you start playing the game, right? So it, it gets much more complicated. Guns but are a feature in that. If you quality. give guns to the wrong people, that's what happens. Uh, now, if you, can you connect that up to me for me with, with drugs? Is this process you've just described, you know, the desperation process, um, the guerrilla process, if you will, well, how does that connect up to drugs? Right. Um, so drugs actually, and I would speak of the of the Colombian context because it's the one I know and it's it's different uh, in, in, in different parts of Latin America. Starts in the 70s, actually, with uh, US citizens that saw that we had a, a, a ripe land to, to grow marijuana, right? Uh, and uh, Colombia has a very significant problem of infrastructure. We have a complicated geography with mountain ranges going through the half through half of the country, and we don't have good roads. It's getting better now; it's better than before, but they're not as good as they should be, right? Uh, so laborers have a problem, and it's like, who's going to buy whatever I grow in my land so I can make a living? Um, and sometimes. If they grow potatoes, if they grow fruits, if they grow bananas, if they grow whatever, no one is going to go through very poor roads to buy that because it's more expensive to get there and buy it. So what is worth buying, uh, growing, that is going to be uh, purchased? That's where drugs uh, come in place, right? People are going to go to buy either a coca plant or marijuana and so on. And the, and the land was ripe to do it because we have very good uh, agricultural conditions. So whatever you plant is going to grow. Uh, and then the people who know the business come and say, you know, let's grow this here in far parts of the country where the authorities are not going to, to reach or we even buy the authorities because the, the amount of money they can offer is, is is capable of, of corrupting people, right? So, so that's where we start. And first it was marijuana and then it was coca, right? Uh, and, and, and coca has been around with, because coca is part of the culture of many indigenous peoples in Latin America, coca, not cocaine. It's a ceremonial plan. And, and since times immemorial, it helped them go through the day and they have rituals and so on. And that's no problem. There's a lot of business from coca aside of cocaine. Uh, and, 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 and so on. So, so that's a differentiation that should be made. 
But where you get to the jump to drugs is because laborers are uh, facing all the situation of inequality, are facing such a hard decision of who's going to buy my crops that someone comes and says, you know, plant this and every time we're going to buy it and we're going to buy it at prices that are not closely related to the ones you would get for planting something else uh, that, that you're, that, that they don't have any other option, right? They don't have any other option to do it, right? And first it was uh, external cartels. First it was, uh, if, if I understand properly, so it came from the US, but then it come from Mexicans and so on. And then the people here said, uh, the big cartels of the 80s and 90s say, you know, before we were helping these people, I think we can run the business on our own. So they did it. So they did it and, and, and so on. And the war on drugs does not work because eradication is not going to be fixed unless you offer these other, uh, like the cultivation of drugs uh, is not going to be fixed unless you offer these people an alternative because they're not happy selling this, but they have no other option, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's the issue. And, and regarding the guerrillas and armed groups, before they also used to take care of the crops of the drug cartels, and then they noticed that they could handle the business as well. Uh, so it grows. And, and, and the approach of eradication is not going to solve anything because what has been demonstrated is that if you eradicate it in Colombia, it's going to increase in Bolivia. And then if you tackle it in Bolivia, it's going to grow in Ecuador and, and so on. It's called the balloon effect and it's mm -hmm. studied. Uh, but that has been the approach from the US since forever and they condition giving you a lot of help to these measures, right? Mm. Uh, that's not optimistic. Um, you know, one, one thing it, uh, that, that, um, that, I, that I'm thinking about just uh, listening to you is the question of whether somebody in one country in Latin America can simply cross the border into another country that he or she believes would be a better place for him. Um, and I, I don't know if it's easy to cross the border. I don't know whether people actually do that. If I'm, if I'm living in uh, Ecuador and I decide that life in, um, in Costa Rica is a better time for me, uh, can I just head off over there and get into that country and get a better job? Is there any kind of uh, sort of equalization, a, a rebalance between countries by way of um, immigration over those borders? So th 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 that happens a lot, right? It happens a lot. Um, uh, because even if we suffer from the same problems, the conditions are not the same and there are countries that are better than others, right? So for example, during the 80s and 90s that Colombia had a very, very hard time, there was a lot, a lot of migration to Venezuela, a lot because they were doing good because of the petroleum and so on. And now that Venezuela is doing poorly, you have a lot of migration to, to Colombia from Venezuela. I was watching before, before the show a video of, of the situation with Haiti and the Haitians before moving uh, to the US, they were trying to move into Argentina or Chile who are doing better. Uh, and the borders are, are flexible. Uh, the restrictions are not as hard as in the US. Uh, so it's easier to cross borders unless a situation comes up and you're being tackled. But it's not only about the border, it's also about the, the pushback you get from the population, right? That, that's also a part. And again, we are societies that face a lot of exclusion, of inequality, of racism, of elitism, of classism. Um, so, so that's complicated. And sometimes even if you try to find opportunities in Latin America, our own problems make that even if you travel into another country, you're going to face the same problems, right? So sometimes it's easier, easier, right? Quotes uh, to go to the US that is not going to make you face these problems, maybe others, but at least you're earning in dollars and that makes it worth it for some people. Yeah. Well, going back, we only have a minute left here, but I want to ask you one last question and I want to re return to the historical view of things. So uh, assume, assume there was, um, and there should be a, a noblesse oblige promise of the US to help its neighbor. Uh, and not only to help its neighbor for the benefit of its neighbor, but for the benefit of the U.S. Uh, a better continent serves everyone on the continent, you know. Um, so my question is, from a point of view of uh, foreign policy, economic policy, immigration policy, health policy, um, 
What, what would you recommend to the U.S. now, given the troubles in Latin America, to make Latin America better, more, you know, more, more healthy, so to speak, uh, and to have a better relationship with it, to improve business, tourism, um, relations in general? What, what should U.S. policy be like? What changes should be made? Well, there I would say two things. Um, regarding one of the, of the big issues that, that uh, mediates the relationship between the U.S. and, and Latin America, that is the drugs and the illegal economy issue, I would say the first thing that the U.S. should do is try to address their side of the problem. Uh, and that definitely is going to have an impact on our side of the problem, right? But if the approach is all on the Latin American side and the interest of the U.S. is all on the Latin American side, instead of targeting consumption, distribution, and those type of things in the U.S., if we're speaking about drugs, that should be one thing. Like, uh, see how these problems have a reflection on your country. That's the first thing. I think that would help a lot, right? Because then you're targeting two sides of the problem. But uh, us, there's someone willing to buy the drugs, for example, or to hire uh, undocumented immigrants in bad conditions and, 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 and ignoring some of, of the guarantees they should give to every worker. People are going to, to get there and drugs are still going to be transported and trafficked there. So that's one issue. Uh, that would, I would say the first. You first have to look inside and see how you're responsible for that part of the problem. The other thing I would say is that you have to be open and respectful of the views and the context of other of the Latin American countries. Even if you have good intentions, you have to acknowledge that they know the reality best. And sometimes things that you would never agree to could be better for the content for the continent than, than imposing your views or conditioning the help and the aid to your views because you consider it they are better even if they are not. Uh, and, and here I'm being extra optimistic because this is not new and this is not me saying something that has not been said before. Uh, but still, I think it's worth saying it once again uh, because maybe sometime the message will be heard, right? Uh, but that's, that's what I would say, uh, establish a relationship, allow more parity, you know, even if we are not equals because politically and economically we're not equal, you have to allow for some parity and discussion for things to work out. Otherwise, it's just a disbalance and, and unfair relationship. Yeah, I, I, uh, I always wanna ask my, uh, my last question, the flip side, the dark side of things, the, uh, the ghost of Christmas future. Um, you know, if, if we do nothing, if we continue on the path we've been on for at least a couple of generations and essentially turning our back on, on Latin America in so many ways, what happens? What do you see the, the evolution to be in that circumstance? Well, just, I would say three things is, are going to happen and they're not good. The first one, these problems are just going to keep increasing, right? And the number's growing and it's going to be a bigger problem for the US because you're going to have more and more people going there. And uh, it seems that that's not something that, that the US government wants to deal with, right? That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that other stakeholders, Russia, China, and so on, are going to take advantage of the gap. Uh, and, and I was reading an article like last week about uh, how the US left aside Latin American infrastructure and how much advantage these other countries took of that, of that gap. With the consequence of the political influence and economical influence you could lose. I, I think that's, that's not good for the US. I'm not sure that's bad for Latin America, but I know it's not good for the US. Uh, and the other thing is that the more you allow these problems to grow, not only in the US, but at home, the more you're going to give space for authoritarian governments to grow because these governments uh, feed themselves on insatisfaction of sending big messages to the people and of eroding democracy on the promise of a better future, right? And that's what we saw, uh, not only in the US with Trump, but that's how you get people like Bolsonaro elected, for example. 
uh, and that's and, and eroding the democracy in the region is not good for anyone. It's not good for the US, it's not good for the security, it's not good for human rights and not good for the people. Uh, but if these problems are not tackled in a good way with good support and allowing the countries to develop solutions for their own contexts, what you're going to get is deeper problems that are going to be exploded by people who feed on insatisfaction. Uh. Well, well said, well put. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in awe of these possibilities and a little afraid. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. Nicholas Sussman, an attorney, a, a member of Project Expedite Justice from Colombia, um, now in the US. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope we can continue this conversation with further news uh, of what is happening. Um, uh, in Latin America and with Latin America. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you, Jane. Always a pleasure. Aloha.